So I want to speak now about the interrelationships between sex, death, and language. Um, I think there might be some surprising connections uh, between the two to consider. Now, uh, everyone knows about the connection between sex and death. Uh, that, for instance, when we look at the way that bacteria reproduce, and there are five kingdoms, according to Lynn Margulis, we have plants, animals, fungi, protists, and bacteria. And the way that bacteria reproduce is asexual. They simply split mitotically and they multiply uh, through asexual reproduction, but they don't have uh, aging. Uh, there isn't a temporal uh, metabolism embedded in them until we get these little creatures called protists. Protists are nucleated cells. They are eukaryotic. Uh, they are their own kingdom. And it is the protist with the nucleated cell uh, that is the first to invent sexual reproduction, which involves gene shuffling and also the introduction now of a temporal metabolism, a being that has been uh, that has come into being through sexual reproduction is doomed to die. Temporal metabolism, therefore, is introduced with the introduction of sexual reproduction into the biological world. Also, temporality, um, in the vitalistic sense that Bergson called la durée, uh, is involved and introduced there. Once you have an organism that has been reproduced through sexual reproduction, um, you also have temporality introduced to, into it, as well as aging. So now to consider then, uh, so we have that distinction. Um, and note the introduction that sexuality introduces aging, uh, temporality, and death into the organism. Uh, the organism uh, that is reproduced sexually is doomed to die. So now when we look at the interrelationships uh, between death and language, language is something that goes all the way back. Uh, and I'm going to suggest that I think that it originates with Homo habilis, but we'll get to that in a bit. Uh, the earliest evidence for the disposal of the dead that we have anywhere in the world comes from Atapuerca, Spain, 600,000 years ago from a cave called Cima de los Huesos, the Pit of the Bones, where, and these are um, 600,000 years ago in Spain, these, these are pre-Neanderthals. They're known as technically as Homo heidelbergensis, but they are essentially Neanderthals. And the Neanderthals apparently um, were undoubtedly speaking and undoubtedly had language because it's obvious that they had ideas here. This pit has an opening in the floor, a hole down into which the Neanderthals threw the bones of about 30 or so individuals, men, women, and children. Uh, and so they were disposing their dead into an orifice or something that was analogized to an orif orifice, which I call the metaphysical vulva, which we'll get to in a moment. That's the earliest evidence, and it's clear that language is something that enables the human being to grasp the essence of death for what it is. Um, you can only do that with language uh, because it enables you to see that the dead thing there is no longer in time. With the exit of the soul from the body, the body becomes holy space, pure spatiality, and it is no longer involved in temporal metabolism. That has been ejected from it with death, and it takes language and the ability to think to recognize this. The next earliest evidence that we have for burial comes to us from Palestine from about 100,000 years ago, and these are now modern Homo sapiens who have migrated out of Africa. Uh, as far as we know, modern Homo sapiens, uh, who are more or less the same as Cro-Magnon men, uh, but they've migrated out of Africa, and they've originated in Africa about 200,000 years ago, something like that. And then we find them in Palestine, apparently peacefully coexisting alongside of Neanderthals, because uh, the second uh, earliest evidence we have comes from the, the famous Shanidar burial 60,000 years ago. But this cave, uh, which had a number of individuals buried in it, this modern Homo sapiens cave, uh, has this interesting burial that is unimaginatively named Q9. And it's simply this woman lying on her side with legs drawn up in a kind of embryonic style with a dead child at her feet. No grave gear. And the only thing that they have added to the grave is red ochre. They've sprinkled red ochre onto the dead body. Now, red ochre is something that is universally associated with burials. It goes all the way across uh, the old world, uh, it goes across into China. Eventually, the Chinese convert it into cinnabar, which is also red, and that cinnabar also migrates across the Pacific into Mesoamerica, so that this red stuff is always associated with burials, almost universally, and it doesn't drop out and, until the Sumerians come in, but we'll get to that in a second. And I think that uh, it was William Irwin Thompson who was the first to suggest rather brilliantly, I think, that red ochre most likely symbolized menstrual blood, because it was thought all the way down as far as Aristotle, and you've got James Hillman in the myth of analysis uh, talking about uh, this, uh, he quotes a passage from Aristotle to the effect that it was long thought that the reason that the woman stopped menstruating when she was pregnant was because she was using, using that blood to build a new fetus in her body. And so when you put the dead body, and note that the legs of Q9 are drawn up, 
in a flexed style to suggest the body of a fetus, a newly born fetus, and you sprinkle the magical symbol for menstrual blood on that body, then it means it's going to rebuild a new body for that individual. And so once again, we have this idea here of the metaphysical vulva. And I want to go into this for a bit here because I've invented this concept largely in reaction to Lacan's concept of the phallus. Now Lacan has this idea, he's got these three orders, as everyone knows, the imaginary, the symbolic, and the real, and he develops this concept of the phallus, and he sort of privileges and spiritualizes the order of the father. Everything is paternal for Lacan. Uh, and the phallus on the plane of the real is simply the actual phallus, uh, but on the plane of the imaginary. Uh, the imaginary has to do uh, with myths and symbols and images, uh, the child's recognition of itself in the mirror. Uh, the ego is a fiction of the subject for Lacan, and um, the ego gets tangled up with imaginary specular images beginning with the mirror stage. Um, and so the goal of uh, Lacanian psychoanalysis is event to eventually extract the ego from being stuck with the imaginary order and uh, symbolically being castrated into the order of the the realm of the symbolic, which is the realm of language. So the imaginary phallus has to do with the fact that the child thinks uh, that it is the phallus, and it wants the mother's attention constantly. And when the mother is elsewhere, the child as phallus wonders where she is. And so eventually what has to happen is what Lacan calls a symbolic castration, where the child has to let go of being the phallus for the mother, and has to accede to the uh, order of the father. The name of the father is the symbolic castration that must occur uh, for the child to uh, move into the, the symbolic order, which for Lacan is not made of images and, and symbols, but of, uh, it's called symbolic, but it, it's the, the realm of the big other and the realm of language. Um, and so he deprivileges the mother. The mother, for some reason, just uh, doesn't figure well uh, in this Lacanian world. And it was my reading of Deleuze, with his book on masochism, <clears throat> that first began to get me to think about this, about the possibility of constructing an, an oppositional term uh, to Lacan's uh, privileged phallus, whereby, by the way, he says that if this symbolic castration does not occur, uh, then the individual can remain stuck in a psychosis or can have psychotic tendencies. So he thinks it's absolutely essential for psychological health in order for this symbolic castration to occur. But now Deleuze comes along with his book on masochism, and note that it's not called sadomasochism, it's called masochism, because Deleuze insists in that book that sadism and masochism are two totally separate things. Sadism is actually the, the realm of the father. Uh, the father is always doing cruel things to his children. That's sadism. That's the realm of the father. It's a totally separate thing from masochism, especially as it first appears in Leopold von Zacher Masoch's book, Venus in Furs, where he makes a contract with uh, the woman that he's with, who is the Venus, and wearing furs. And that contract is designed to uh, chase out the father from the maternal order, so that uh, in masochism, an alliance is made with the mother to drive out the symbolic order of the father, to get him out, and to create a new, different kind of overturning of Lacan's privileging of the father, which I find very interesting. And it got me to thinking about the creation of the possibility of this concept, which I call the metaphysical vulva, which also exists on uh, the three orders. The, the vulva on the real, on the plane of the real is simply the real vagina. But on the plane of the imaginary and symbolic, I tie them to two distinct orders of history, uh, which I analogize to Gene Gebser's idea of the mythical consciousness structure and the mental consciousness structure. Now, the metaphysical vulva um, is the maternal vulva that rules during the age of Gebser's mythical consciousness structure, which, which extends all the way, uh, let's say, from the great mother um, with her pendulous breasts and body as a symbol of fertility in the caves with the Venus of Willendorf, going all the way down past the first generation of high civilization with Sumer and Egypt, which are still embedded in the mythical consciousness structure. Uh, that's the age of the maternal vulva, and the age of the maternal vulva is the age in which uh, the mother has all the creative power, and in fact, she can even reproduce spontaneously, uh, parthena genetically, as it's called, without the aid of insemination by a father, as we still find her on the first archaic pages of Hesiod's Theogony. Hesiod, in opposition to Homer, he lives about a century or so after Homer. Uh, Homer, uh, Homer was a seaman. He lived on the islands, and the myths and tales that he recounts are fresh and new, while at the same time conservative, but Hesiod actually was a farmer, a landlocked farmer in Boeotia who was in possession of much older myths, I think, more, older, more agrarian myths, 
that still recall the age of the metaphysical vulva on the first page of the Theogony, you get Gaia, the earth, spontaneously and without insemination by her husband, Ornos, she gives birth to Ornos. She gives birth to chaos and to Tartarus uh, and to all these metaphysical cosmological principles that simply spring out of her uh, as the metaphysical vulva, which has the power to create parthenogenically uh, that may be inseminated or not inseminated by uh, the phallus of the father, but it's not absolutely necessary. However, when we come to the age of uh, what would correspond to Lacan's symbolic order, which would be um, the paternal vulva, the paternal vulva comes about during the second generation of civilization, what uh, Jean Gebser once again calls the mental consciousness structure as it comes in across the board now with the Greeks, with the Hebrews, uh, the Persians and the, the Hindus and the Chinese, all four of those civilizations emerge out of the chaos of the second millennium which from about 1700 BC going all the way down to 1200 BC is a time of collapse, and disintegration, and degeneration of the first, uh, the first generation of civilization, what Toynbee calls generation number one, the Sumerians on the one hand and the Egyptians on the other. During that whole second millennium, they're in a state of total disintegration and decay. They were never philosophically inclined civilizations. They didn't have philosophy. They, all they had was myth and religion and theological thinking that went along with that, but it was never deterritorialized into philosophy until you get this second generation uh, going across the board here um, with the Greeks, the Jews, the Persians. Uh, they, these are all the philosophically inclined civilizations that come into being, and they appropriate the metaphysical vulva from the Great Mother, and they transform it into the paternal vulva now. And the paternal vulva uh, is what is in the father's mind that enables him to give birth to the word, to the Logos, just as Zeus now gives birth to Athena from out of his head. Prometheus has to get an axe to help him chop the head open, and out springs Athena. The exact same image, by the way, in the movie Alien, uh, when the chest burster first bursts out of Cain's chest, it's a displacement from the head uh, to the solar plexus, but it's the same idea here of the paternal vulva, the male giving birth to the female, except that it's really a symbol for giving birth on the plane of the logos, the plane of the word. Uh, later, for example, Zeus gives birth to Dionysus from out of his thigh. Uh, Semele wants to see him in all his glory. Uh, he hurls a thunderbolt at her. It's too much for her, and out of the ashes of her dead body, the gods restore uh, the, the womb, or the embryo, rather, of Dionysus, and is stitched into Zeus's thigh, and so he gives birth uh, there again, out of uh, his thigh. That's another example of the paternal vulva, as is the opening myth in the book of Genesis, when Yahweh reaches down and opens the side of Adam vaginally to extract a rib bone, which, of course, is, becomes the first woman, Eve. That's another example of the male appropriation of the maternal vulva to deterritorialize and reterritorialize it as the paternal vulva. Um, now, that will go all the way down into science, the paternal vulva, and, of course, the rational mental consciousness structure that we're in the tail end of here, goes all the way down into science inheriting this paternal vulva from religious and mythological ideas and wanting to create through cloning and genetic engineering to appropriate the creative biological powers of the mother by the father. These are mostly done by men in laboratories designing all this stuff up to create artificial life, for whether for good or ill. Who, who knows what's going to be the consequences? I suspect that it's going to be very messy and very ethically difficult to uh, disentangle. But this idea that science has with the paternal vulva, and all this is covered in Ridley Scott's Alien movies, the four Alien movies that he did, or rather the three plus uh, the James Cameron, they all have to do with uh, the struggle between the maternal vulva of the mythic order and the paternal vulva of the order of science and patriarchy. Science has gotten this idea from religion. It has inherited the paternal vulva from, from religion. That's, that's where it's come from. And so then we have this idea of the appropriation of the vulva, and in these high civilizations, Let's go back a moment to the first generation of the high civilizations with the Sumerians on the one hand and the Egyptians on the other. They also have each of these high civilizations comes into being with a new death cult, but also a new way of understanding human sexuality. Because sex and death, as we have seen from the beginning, are always intimately interconnected. You can't have a change in one area without a corresponding change in the other. And so with the first generation of civilization with the Sumerians, who are first on the mark here, as Fernand Bradell remarks in his History of the Mediterranean, does it matter who's first on the mark? And I think it does. What the Sumerians have done is that 3500 BC, they've been in this land forever between the two rivers. They've been there forever. And uh, they've had these Neolithic death cults 
where the dead, uh, the living had a very cozy relationship with the dead. The dead were buried under the floors uh, of their sleeping quarters at Chattahoyak, as well as many other places than just Chattahoyak. And so it took a while, a long, long time, but eventually, uh, in about the, right around the year 5000 BC, somewhere in there, you start getting the dead being separated out into separate cemeteries that are over there. The dead are over there yonder now. We, the living, are here. And this ontological rift now that was introduced by the Sumerians between the living and the dead is one of the things that I think made possible the advent of high civilization now because you no longer have the ancestors looking over your shoulder. Um, and the ancestors are based on conserving the archive of a civilization. They're always, the response to any innovation with the ancestors is always going to be, no, don't do it. You'll damage the archive. But with them out of the way now, uh, suddenly we get... Uh, 4,000 to 3,500 B.C. in Mesopotamia, a whole series of innovations that start springing into being, writing, mathematics, uh, the construction of monumental temple architecture, um, all kinds of new things start coming into being with the Sumerians that are based on innovation. And now the gods are no longer associated with the ancestors and conservation of the dead, but rather with innovation and technology. Each one of these new gods is associated with a craft or a technology, and none is the patron goddess of astronomy. Enki is the god who has all the solutions to all the, the problems. He's the technological god par excellence. There's a god that's associated with the making of mud bricks. Kulab, I think his name is. Um, the, this, the boat god uh, Nanasin, who is the primary god of the sister city of Uruk, Ur, uh, is the god that's associated with boats and the crescent moon shape of the boats that are classic in Mesopotamia. Each one of the gods now becomes a patron saint, uh, a new form of technology, and the Sumerians are totally uh, creating the singularization of the invention of civilization here. And I think also that a new way of understanding sexuality probably comes in along with this at the same time where I think possibly for the first time sexuality becomes deterritorialized from reproduction with the figure of Inanna, who is the primary goddess at the city of Ur. She was the, associated with the planet Venus and was the mistress of both sex as well as war. Um, more so war later, I think, with the Babylonians when she becomes Ishtar. I think the initial idea with the Sumerians was that she was the goddess of human sexuality. And note that Inanna, in complete differentiation from the great mother um, throughout history up to that point, uh, has no offspring. She has no children. So her sexuality, she's the mistress of sexuality, is no longer associated with procreation, but rather with joy. And so we get the cults of the prostitutes that are coming in, the sacred prostitutes to Inanna, uh, who perform these services, and it's part of an actual uh, ritual regimen that they bring in here. Sexuality uh, in and for itself is not necessarily something that's even tied to reproduction. So we have Inanna, and we have this idea of a new uh, sex cult. And I think possibly in Egypt about this time, around 3000 BC, of course, with Egypt, we get the innovation there of the pyramids. Uh, the new death cult with mummification that comes in and the rise of pyramids. Most likely there was also a new understanding of sexuality there as well, since we have the old myth that associates the river, the uh, seasonal uh, flooding of the Nile with the semen of the dead god Osiris ejaculating into the body of Isis, who is the land, uh, in accordance with the heliacal rising of Sirius, uh, the dogs, or Sirius, the, the star that was associated with Isis, whereas Orion above Sirius was uh, associated with Osiris, and their rising right about the time of July was always meant to be uh, symbolic of a sexual act between them that inaugurated the flooding of the Nile and the greening of the land. Possibly a similar myth uh, can also be found in Sumer, where we get not the, a myth itself per se, but we've got the image uh, that's usually associated with the iconography associated with the god Enki, where you have a jar, and the jar is a visual pun on a, a phallus with a scrotum underneath it uh, with two streams coming out of it as a symbolic of semen. But, of course, it's two streams because in uh, Sumer we have the two rivers, the Tigris and the Euphrates, uh, that were then probably originally meant to have come into being through a masturbatory act from the god Enki, whose ejaculation onto the land created the two rivers. Uh, and it's long known that these rivers were associated with, with semen. And so there again, we're already starting to get a patriarchal shift, even in this first generation of civilization, to the paternal uh, power coming in and displacing the power of the great mother, even though uh, that's a gradual process that doesn't really get going until the second generation of civilization. So we have all this to consider in terms of these relationships between sex, death, and language, and then I just want to leave you with one more thought, which has to do with my idea that language is also tied in with the particular 
way in which human sexuality has been deterritorialized from the biological body that we're incarnate in. If we think about Homo habilis, and Homo habilis goes back to about, oh, two million years ago, something like that, two, two and a half million, uh, and overlaps with the Australopithecines, uh, Lucy dates from three and a half million years ago. And the Australopithecines were, uh, were not uh, really omnivores, they were, um, they were herbivores. Uh, but Homo habilis comes in with an expanded cranial capacity now that goes up to about 900 cc's. Uh, and this individual made tools. Uh, Australopithecines probably did not, but we know for certain that Homo habilis did. We have the Old Allen Chopper Tool Industries, which are these rocks that have been flaked and shaped uh, to perform specific functions. Um, now, when you have that concept of the creation of a tool, you have to have the ability to think abstractly in terms of concepts, that faculty which Schopenhauer called uh, Verstand, that human beings have, which animals do not have. And for Schopenhauer, Verstand is the faculty, uh, the human faculty to create words uh, and language. With that comes in the ability also to make tools, so that Homo habilis must certainly have spoken language, certainly already had language. Uh, you can infer it from this. And I think that the type of sexuality also that we associate with the human world that makes humans so ontologically distinct from animals. Uh, Heidegger says in his letter on humanism, uh, in response to humanism, that uh, there is an abyss of ontological difference between the human and the animal. Uh, they're two totally ontologically separate entities. And the problem that he has with the humanistic tradition, as inherited from the Romans down th through the Renaissance and so forth, is that it conceives of man simply as the rational animal. Man's an animal like all other animals that just happens to have the faculty of reason added to him as well. Heidegger says, no, there's an abyss of difference because the human being has language and language is the house of being. And it is with language that the human being is able to construct world horizons because he makes a distinction between, uh, in his book on the metaphysics of, um, uh, of, the, metaphysics, of the metaphysics of boredom, the one where he talks about boredom, where he's talking about the fact that the animal is poor in the world because the animal, uh, even though it has what Jakob von Uxkel called an Umwelt, a world around, is nonetheless poor in the world because uh, the beetle, for example, going along a blade of grass, doesn't see the blade of grass for what it is, but simply sees it as a way path for the beetle. It's a pathway for the beetle to get through to somewhere else. Uh, the lizard sunning itself on a rock uh, doesn't see the rock for what it is, but simply as a resting place for the lizard to be there and soak up the sun. Uh, they don't have, they're poor in the world in that sense, uh, whereas, of course, the mineralogical world has no world at all. Animals are poor in the world, but human beings with language create worlds. And I think that with Homo habilis, I think this is the demarcator. Uh, there's some evidence that Homo habilis uh, hunted the Australopithecines to extinction and most likely cannibalized and ate them, uh, which is the reason why most likely they disappeared. And all of this took place in East Africa. But I think the kind of sexuality that human beings have that make us so different from animal sexuality uh, with things like oral sex, anal sex, uh, s and the various different wonderful kinds of fetishes that we have, all this different kind of human sexuality uh, comes about as the result of the brain's deterritorialization of language from the body. Now, this concept of deterritorialization comes from Deleuze and Guattari, where they talk about in A Thousand Plateaus how, for instance, uh, the mouth is a deterritorialized snout. The hand is a deterritorialized paw. Um, lips, teeth, and tongue have been deterritorialized from their original function as nourishment, suckling the nipple, to become uh, the vessel and instrument re-territorialized as language. Um, so this deterritorialization process is something that the human being does that no other animals do. They're all stuck with their territories. But the human being with language has deterritorialized sexuality from biologically incarnate from being biologically incarnate, where it occurs as an act simply of reproduction, uh, to the kind of sexuality that we have, oral sex, for instance, I don't think is something that, it's not something that animals do, as far as I know, and I think it's something you can't really do unless you have the concept for it. It presupposes an idea, and so the human being has to have the idea with language in order to deterritorialize and begin the kinds of sexuality that we have. One final thought, then, is that with the human being has come out of the, the, the vulva on the plane of the real, the biological vulva uh, that gave birth to it from out of the animal world. The, the human being comes out of what we used to call nature, but nature is now extinct, as I wrote about in my book, The Age of Catastrophe, because with the deterritorialization of the intellect from the body now, what we have done is to exteriorize our technologies. As McLuhan said, technologies are 
externalizations of the human mind and body out into the physical world. We have now surrounded the Earth for the first time with a kind of exoskeleton made out of intellect. The Earth, Gaia, now exists for the first time in its history on the inside of the human brain. It has been completely surrounded and encompassed by the human brain, and it now exists on that inside there, just as in the Hindu myth of the capturing of the Earth, uh, Gaia, by the elephant demon who comes up, grabs her, and carries her down to the underworld. And Vishnu has to rescue her by incarnating himself as a boar to dive down, dig up the sediment, and bring her back up so that she can become uh, the Earth. Um, so too, we now begin to wonder, who will rescue this capture of Gaia from the uh, abduction, her abduction by the intellect, but where she has now been taken capture, uh, been taken captive, and now the ice caps are melting. The entire planet is going to change in five centuries. It will be totally unrecognizable as a result of putting it on the inside of the human intellect and the human intellect's deterritorialization, both from the biological body and now from the Earth, uh, to put us into the situation that we are now in.